Hi everyone, and this is James Jones from the University of Minnesota coming back again to finish up the series on electronic structure programming uh, for chemistry. Uh, in the past, we've written a Hartree-Fock program, which has gone through the Hartree-Fock algorithm, uh, looking at the hydrogen molecule <clears throat> and the 631G basis set. And what we're going to do in the next two videos is we're going to take that program that we've already written and expand it to being a density functional theory program. Uh, and it turns out that once you have a Hartree-Fock program written, it's actually pretty straightforward to extend it to do density functional theory, and there are some pretty uh, clear advantages to doing that. So let's go ahead and start talking about some of the differences between Hartree-Fock and density functional theory, not from a pure theoretical standpoint. There are plenty of other uh, options out there if you want to learn more about that, but from a practical standpoint, what are some of the differences and how do we implement them? Okay, so uh, just a reminder the Hartree-Fock Approximation assumes that our wave function psi is a single Slater determinant, and it calculates the average electron-electron repulsion energy, ignoring electron correlation. Right? So the energies that we get out uh, can be significantly improved by using multiple Slater determinants and including electron-electron correlation. Uh, this can be done either perturbatively or through something like couple cluster or CCSD, um, uh, but this is very expensive. Okay, it and by expensive, I mean it takes a lot of computer time. An alternative to that is to use density functional theory. And in density functional theory, we're going to say our energy is a functional of the density. And so, uh, just for those of you that don't know, a function takes one point, take, take, takes a value as an input, and gives you an output number, right? So it takes input a number, outputs a number. A functional takes a function as an input, and outputs a number. So our input here is going to be the density at every point in space, x, y, and z, uh, and our energy will be a functional of that function, the density. Okay. We're going to find the lowest energy state by minimizing the functional of the energy. Right? So that sounds pretty similar to minimizing the energy of the Hartree-Fock wave function. We're going to include correlation. We're going to find this comes at a lower computational cost. The downside to this is we're going to have to approximate and guess at the form for exchange and correlation. So Hartree-Fock has exchange exactly correct uh, and has no correlation. DFT, we're going to approximate both the exchange and the correlation. Okay, and we don't, we're not going to know what the exact form should be, so we have to make some guesses here. Okay, so. We're not going to go through all the different types of density functional theory. We're going to stick with cone sham density functional theory, which is the most popular. And here we're going to have our energy as a functional of the density. And that's going to be equal to the kinetic energy, which is a functional of the density. The electron nuclear attraction, which is a function of the density. And the nuclear positions, but we're going to stay in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. So these nuclear positions are going to be fixed. The nuclear-nuclear repulsion is a function of nuclear coordinates. Again, that's just going to be a number and fixed throughout our calculation. And then this last bit, the exchange correlation potential, uh, which is a functional of the density, is everything else. And the key element to cone charm density functional theorem is we don't know what the actual functional for the kinetic energy should be. And so we're going to replace this with a reference system. And that's going to be the kinetic energy of a set of non-interacting fermions that have the same density as our real system. Okay. And that sounds really fancy, but it's, you, you'll see that it's actually really straightforward to implement. Okay. And the idea is that that should be the same order of magnitude as the kinetic energy of the real interacting system. And any discrepancies between the real kinetic energy and our reference kinetic energy are going to get lumped into the exchange correlation potential. So when we say exchange correlation potential, we mean, we mean it has correlation, it has exchange, and it also has some kinetic energy components to it. Okay, so just a little heads up. All right, so let's talk about practical changes to the code. Most of the code we don't have to change. We don't need to make any changes to how we initialize it, to our basis functions, or anything related to the calculation of the initial Hamiltonian, H0, or the average Coulomb repulsion, which we're going to term the integral J. We don't need the Hartree-Fock exchange, and instead we're going to replace that with the exchange correlation potential, Vxc. Now we don't actually know what Vxc should be for real systems, so we're going to make the simplest approximation possible, 
which is we're going to approximate it with the exchange and correlation energies of a uniform electron gas at each point in space with a density rho of r. Okay, so imagine that uh, I'm looking at a molecule H2 and I have two hydrogen atoms. The density is not going to be uniform as we go through. But we're going to approximate the exchange correlation energy density as that that's due to exchange correlation at this point. <clears throat> imagine, sorry, let me, let's start that over again. The two atoms, I'm going to pick a point here at this spot, and it's going to have some density rho of r. Right? It's going to have some density rho. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to approximate the exchange correlation at that point as well the exchange correlation is for a uniform electron gas with that same density. And then I'll pick another point, and the density will be different. And I'll assign a different value for the exchange correlation potential for that point. Okay? And so that exchange correlation potential becomes a functional of what our density is. All right. There are lots of different ways that we can do this. It turns out um, there's not an analytic form where we don't know an analytic form uh, for the exchange correlation potential, even in that local approximation. And so we're going to use uh, something from the, uh, from the literature, which is uh, from Vosco uh, et al., uh, and the reason I'm going to use that is because that's what's used in the, the Gaussian quantum chemistry package for the local density approximation. Okay. So if you go to the literature and try to look this up, you know, what you'll find is that most papers don't report the exchange correlation potential directly, and, and there's good reason for that. Instead, what they report is the energy density, epsilon sub xc, the exchange correlation energy density, and the reason for that is that the the energy term related to exchange correlation is the integral over all space of the <clears throat> of the density times the energy density of the exchange correlation functional. Okay. Now, if we have the energy density, it turns out that we can go from that to the potential very quickly. The exchange correlation potential is defined as a variation in the energy term with respect to uh, the density itself. And this is a functional derivative. We're not going to go into the details of that. But suffice it to say that um, when we apply the chain rule up here to this energy term, we get that the derivative is the exchange correlation potential times the density plus the density times the derivative of the exchange correlation potential, sorry, the exchange correlation energy density with respect to the density itself. And I'll show you uh, what that looks like in just a second. We're going to start by looking at the exchange potential. So we talked about the exchange correlation potential. We're going to separate that into exchange correlation is equal to exchange plus correlation. Okay. Um, and so the exchange density, the actual exchange density for uniform electron gas, we know it has a really simple term. This was first figured out by uh, Paul Dirac. Um, so remember the EX, that's going to be the exchange energy density. And Dirac determined that this should have the should be some constant times the density to the one third, and that constant ends up being minus three quarters times the one third root, the cube root of three over pi times the density raised to the one third power. Okay, so that looks a little funny, but no big deal. That's actually easy to write down. Uh, so that's the exchange energy density. To find the potential, I need to take the derivative of this with respect to the density. So rho times the derivative of this. If I take the derivative of this with respect to rho, right, I'm going to pull down rho to the minus two-thirds, an extra one-third power. And then I get the following. And I multiply that on through, and I get that the exchange potential is some numbers times the density raised to the one-third power. That's pretty easy. I can probably program that pretty quickly. Correlation, on the other hand, is equal to four thirds times the energy uh, exchange energy density, right over here. Okay, so that's the exchange. So here's the exchange potential. Here's the exchange energy density, and we're able to go from one to the other. All right, now let's take a look at the correlation side. The correlation side, we don't have an analytical form for, even for the homogeneous electron gas. The energies are well known from Monte Carlo calculations, uh, and we know what the high density asymptote should be and the low density asymptote. 
And so we can approximate how to go from one to the other. And there are various different approximations and ways to do this. Um, but again, we're going to use the VWN, the, the Vosco, Wilk, and Nusser approximation, uh, and VWN3. And they approximate that electron correlation energy is this big, messy term down here. That you have some parameter A times all of this. And we have X, capital X, B, Q, X naught, and that. All right, so that's pretty ugly looking, right? Um, all right, so let's, let's break this down. Uh, so before we get to X, let's define the radius of a sphere with one electron at density rho, of uniform electron density at density rho. We can define that pretty easily just by remembering the formula for density of a sphere. We get that, that radius should be 3 over 4 pi times the density raised to the one, minus 1 third power. Okay. We're going to take that radius. X here is going to be the square root of R. Capital X is this quadratic polynomial. Q is equal to a number, four, square root of 4C minus B squared. <clears throat> and then these are all fit. And so we fit these parameters, A, B, C, and X naught, uh, the VW ended. And these are the numbers that they get out. So this is an ugly looking functional for the energy density. For correlation. To get the correlation potential, we need to take the derivative of this with respect to the density. And so let's do that. Uh, do, 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 right? So we're going to take the correlation potential as the correlation energy plus the density. And I'm going to do this. Uh, you can evaluate that, that derivative for yourself if you want, but let's uh, avoid that mess. And I'm going to tell you what the answer is, which is the correlation energy minus this little polynomial here, where a, b, and c are the same fitting parameters that we used before. Okay. And that's it. That's the correlation potential. So it looks really ugly, but it turns out we can program it pretty quickly. And once we program it once, we never have to do it again. So no big deal. All right. So once we have the potential for the exchange and the correlation, we can calculate their matrix representation in our basis set the same way we calculate everything else, right? So the matrix element, the ij matrix element, is going to be the integral over all space of basis i times the exchange correlation potential at each point in space times uh, basis function j, d tau. And this would have a complex conjugate, but we're going to use all real basis functions. Okay. Now, here's a key difference between DFT and Hartree-Fock. In Hartree-Fock, we used a Gaussian basis set because we could evaluate all of our integrals analytically. Right? Even when we have higher angular momentum, and we can evaluate those analytically. We don't need to actually do numerical integration anywhere. For DFT, remember, we're going to be raising these to the one-third power. We're going to be taking, if you go back to look at the correlation, we're going to be taking the log and the inverse tangent. Uh, these are no longer available. You, we, we can't solve these analytically, and we need numerical integration. Okay. So the exchange uh, for, to evaluate the exchange correlation potential. Similarly, the exchange correlation energy has to be evaluated numerically as well. Okay. Now we're going to do this the simplest way possible. We're going to take the lazy way, and rather than do something uh, that takes more programming and would be faster, we're going to do this the easiest way, which is we're just going to build a grid of x, y, and z points and approximate these integrals as their beam on some. Okay. There are faster, much much faster ways of doing this. Um, but we're going to do this for our small, simple systems, and we'll find that this works reasonably well. So here's what we're going to do. Here's our new SCF loop. We're going to start with our density matrix. We're going to build the average electron-electron repulsion term, just like we did in hartree fock Then we're going to build our correlation and our exchange potentials, and we're going to integrate over them to calculate the different matrix elements. We'll build a new Fock matrix. Our Fock matrix is equal to our initial Hamiltonian, our electrostatic repulsion, our exchange potential, and our correlation potential. We'll transform that to a molecular orbital basis. We'll find the eigenvalues of that Fock matrix. Build a new density matrix by filling the n over two lowest orbitals. Calculate the energies. Check for self-consistency. Use that new density matrix to build a new density. 
And then we're going to repeat this loop again and again and again until our energy and our density stop changing. And we're going to just stop it when our energy stops changing because we're going to be relatively easy. Okay. So on a practical level, what files do we have to change? These files in black need very minor changes. HF driver, we're going to change the DFT driver just so we can keep track of it. SCF, we're going to change the DFT SCF. We need to change a couple of terms in there. Build Coulomb exchange, we're going to change the build heart tree, right? Because we only need to calculate the electrostatic repulsion. And then we need to make a couple of new terms. We need to build our basis functions. We need to build a density. Given a density matrix, we need to be able to build an actual density at points X, Y, and Z. Build exchange and build correlation. And then we also need to evaluate our exchange correlation energy. Okay? And that's it. So these are the new functions, routines that we need to write. These are a couple that we need to make minor changes to. And that's all we have to do to change our functional program from hartree fock to density functional theory. Stay tuned for the next video where I'll walk you through how I made those programming changes. And then you'll have your own DFT program. Hopefully this is helpful, and I will see you in the next video.